Recorded on January 26th, 2019, Stanton Friedman, the world's leading ufologist, did perhaps his final on-camera interview for our feature film, The Bigfoot Alien Connection Revealed. Here is the interview in full. Give me your thoughts on ancient to present day visitations to Earth by extraterrestrial intelligences. I certainly think there's no reason to think that we're suddenly getting visitations. I think aliens have come here for thousands or millions of years. Uh, the, the thing that I look upon the, the local galactic neighborhood, uh, and I'm well aware of how many stars and how many planets there are. We, Frank Drake in 1961 talked about there being 8,000 places where aliens might send signals from. Uh, the SETI community, which I think it really stands for silly effort to investigate rather than search for extraterrestrial intelligence, they totally ignore all the evidence relating to flying saucers. We have an enormous amount of evidence indicating aliens are visiting Earth. That doesn't mean we know where they're from, what they want, how they operate, or anything else. It says they're not from here, intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. And when you figure that the Earth, you know, in, in 1650, we thought the Earth was uh, created in 4004 BC, said Bishop Usher. Now we say 4 billion <laughs> BC. So I think, and, and that the universe is 13 billion years old. So to think everything just started recently for us, and we're the, at the top of the heap is, is absurd. I think there have been civilizations coming and going for literally billions of years. So I think that there's overwhelming evidence that aliens are visiting. I think one major reason for that would be that suddenly we're a threat to the neighborhood. We're a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. I mean, World War II, we only killed 50 million people. This is truly a primitive society. But suddenly, in 1938, we learned about fusion, nuclear fusion. 1939, about nuclear fission. I've worked on propulsion systems, fusion and fission. So any sensible alien would know it's a big step when a society figures out nuclear energy. Nuclear fusion is what produces the energy in all the stars. So now we're linked to the universe. So I think that uh, aliens have been coming for a long time. I think there's a very busy place out there. In 61, Frank Drake talked about maybe 8,000 places in the galaxy that could send us signals. He didn't talk about flying saucers. So he ignores all the evidence that aliens are visiting and talks theoretical stuff about maybe somebody out there is sending a signal for what reason we don't know, what technology we don't know. I think the important thing is to look at the data that shows that aliens are visiting. And I think one good reason for them to visit is to keep tabs on what could be the scourge of the neighborhood, so to speak. Uh, we're not very nice. The military budget on the planet's a trillion dollars this year, something like that. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting that suddenly SETI is coming into looking at the real world, but they never talk about flying saucers. It's like they're out there and they're sending signals and we'll listen for them. But they're not coming here because if they were, they'd want to talk to us, which is absurd, uh, frankly. So uh, I'm intrigued with all of that. And I try to look at the bigger picture. You know, Frank talked about maybe 8,000 planets in the galaxy. The latest notion is that there's, when you start looking at stars, and now we can actually observe planets around other stars. It's, it's very neat science that we can detect the presence of planets out there. It looks like there's 1.6 planets per star. If you take it, hundreds of planets, that's the average you get out of it. That means in our galaxy, we got over 100 billion planets. That changes the picture from six or 8,000, uh, I think. <laughs> there's a big difference. So just as we thought, you know, we're the 
the center of God's creation, if I can put it that way, uh, we now realize that's absurd, that we're not. And so that changes your view of where we fit in the scheme of same things. Like I say, a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. And of course they would be interested in us because we're a threat to take our brand of friendship, which everybody else looks upon as not very nice, and be aggressive to them. What do we do? You know, World War II, we killed 50 million people. This is not a nice society. We haven't learned how to get along with other societies. So I expect the Galactic Federation says, hey, these guys need to be kept away from the rest of us. We don't want that kind of activity out here. So that's a different way of looking at things. But uh, certainly, in contrast to the SETI movement, which has not a bit of evidence at all to say that anybody is sending signals here, the ufological movement says we have enormous amounts of evidence that aliens are visiting. We can't answer the questions of what do they want, why are they here, how do they operate. But we need to remember that what's important about flying saucers to many people on this planet is their technology. They would make wonderful weapons delivery and defense systems. The first country to be able to duplicate them is going to rule the planet because they can fly circles around anything we got flying. We're, we're primitive. And so one can understand that the governments of the world do not want to tell their people that there are alien visitors here. First, it would be admitting we're not the center of the universe. We're not the all-powerful, all-knowing, et cetera. Second, no government wants its citizens to owe their allegiance to the planet as opposed to that government. I think we can safely say nationalism is the only game in town on planet Earth. I'm Russian, I'm Greek, I'm American, I'm whatever, Polish, uh, it doesn't matter. Those are our identities. You don't find many people standing up and saying, I'm an earthling. But that's what we are, like it or not. And I think the big challenge for mankind is to get to that point. And then maybe we can talk to the Galactic Federation. There's nobody who speaks for planet Earth. And there are a lot of people who'd like to, but I mean, the, there isn't anybody who has the power to make decisions that affect everybody on the planet other than badly, you know, <laughs> destruction that affects everybody. What are your thoughts on alien contact with humans? I don't know that aliens haven't talked to people. Uh, there's the famous story about Ike meeting with aliens in the desert. And if there's one guy you'd say might have gotten involved in such a thing, one president, I think Ike would be the choice. Uh, he was a great negotiator. He knew how to get people to behave properly with each other. That's an awkward way of putting it. But uh, I think that we're being observed. I think we don't have too much time before we need to change how, our, how we go about things on this planet and start thinking in planetary terms. Uh, I don't think aliens are going to take us by the hand, but I think they're not going to let us take our brand of friendship out there. Because I think, you know, for a while we thought the world was created in 4004 BC. That's not, not long. I mean, that's 6,000 years. As soon as you say, oh, it's more than 5 billion years old, that changes things. That means that we're not the first. There's no reason at all to say that we're the first or the second or the tenth. There have been loads of civilizations before us. And they probably all had to come to terms with the regional, regionalization of groups of people and working together. Uh, you know, it took Magellan three years to go around the planet. The space station does it in 95 minutes. 
Uh, times have changed considerably. So I'm saying there's an important day of reckoning coming in the near future, but we haven't shown much evidence of learning how to live with each other in a peaceful fashion. There are too many people who benefit from there being large military programs on the planet. Uh, you know, a trillion dollars a year is a lot of money being spent. And there are a lot of people who don't want to throw that away. <laughs> you know, you mean you want to stop our military programs here? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think so. So. I, I'm, I wish I would be around when this all gets resolved into where we're going from here. I don't know where, but I, I won't be here, I don't think. You've often said that governments are covering up the existence of aliens. Can you elaborate? I'm saying the government has covered a great deal up. That's not surprising. I had a security clearance for 14 years, a Q clearance. I worked on advanced propulsion systems. Anybody who thinks governments can't keep things secret is being unrealistic entirely. I mean, the stealth uh, aircraft was developed in complete secrecy at a cost of $10 billion over a 10-year period. Anybody who says secrets can't be kept is saying, well, I don't know about any, so there must not be any, which is a very self-centered and egotistical and inappropriate way of thinking about things. Secrets can be kept and are being kept all the time. Uh, and a lot of people think, well, if you've got a top secret clearance, you have access to everything that's top secret, right? No, wrong. There are two things. You need the appropriate security level and you need and a need to know. And without the need to know, you don't get access. It doesn't matter what your clearance is. So we have some education to do about how governments can keep secrets. And no government's going to say, we don't want to keep secrets anymore. Come on. People in power want to stay in power. That's the name of the game. How would you characterize America's early UFO study known as Project Blue Book? Project Blue Book Special Report 14. Two important things about it. It was done in the mid-50s. They looked at 3,201 sightings, an Air Force study. And they found, they, there's all kinds of charts, tables, graphs, maps. It's chock full of data. And it was found that 21.5% of the cases couldn't be identified. That there were some cases that had to be listed as insufficient information. There was aircraft, balloon, astronomical, etc. But they found the better the quality of the sighting, the more likely to be unexplainable, which means that it's probably real data. They looked at a chi-square analysis, the characteristics of the unknowns versus the knowns. Did the two groups match? The chance that the unknowns are just misknowns, less than 1%. But in the press release, the report was not distributed, but a press release was given very wide distribution in the mid-50s. They said even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available. That's a complete and total lie. The unknowns weren't 3%. Their own tables showed 21.5%. So three is not, or 21 and a half, is not three rounded off by any stretch of the imagination. So it was a flat out lie, and that set the tone for the next 70 years, uh, which is very unfortunate. What do you think about the argument that confirmation that we are not alone would cause panic? I don't think that that's, that it's really the case that Recognition on a large scale, publicly, that we are not alone would cause panic. I think if it's handled properly, we've gone through some tough times on this planet. Everybody knows there are nuclear weapons. We haven't seen people panicking all over the place. That's certainly something that threatens us if we're to use them unwisely. You know, it's not like you, you can affect one family with a nuclear weapon. <laughs> affect a whole society. So uh, the, the fear of panic can be properly handled by astute leadership. And also, I think there's been an enormous change in our attitude about space beings, if you will, beings from elsewhere. 
where a majority of people, I'm sure at one point, not too long ago, probably within my lifetime, it was they must be terrible and a scourge and they're gonna destroy us and if there's anybody out there, we're, we're in deep trouble, et cetera, et cetera. I think now <clears throat> most people are aware that there's nothing special about us and that we have to solve our problems and that there probably are beings out there. Look, I've given more than 700 lectures in 19 countries, uh, 50, all 50 states, uh, all 10 provinces of Canada, and I find very few examples of people being, ah, it's terror, terror, no, no. What do, is, where do we go from here? How do you view the emerging evidence that many people are already in contact with the aliens through experiences? Experiences like the appearance of Bigfoot. It's kind of funny. Uh, I think there are, there's ample evidence that there are creatures that I will call Bigfoot because I don't know what else to call them here. Whether these are transplants from someplace else, maybe the heavy lifters for the aliens that are coming here, I don't know. Uh, I think they're part of the picture of us having to realize that we need to expand our view of ourselves, our planet, our neighborhood. I mean, after all, we sent a spacecraft past the planet Pluto. If I told somebody that 90 years ago, they'd say, you're crazy, man. You know, it's impossible. You can't get here from there, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. And now we know it's true. And I worked on a study of fusion propulsion for deep space travel back in 1962. Fusion is what goes on in H-bonds, but it's also what goes on in all the stars. That's the primary source of energy in the universe. Everybody's going to know about fusion when they get to a certain point. It was the late 1930s for us. We're latecomers because there's umpteen billion years before that in which people would have gotten to that point. I haven't seen any signs that we are smarter than people lived 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. We're more advanced, but that's building on what went before. It doesn't mean we're, we're inherently, they didn't start off stupid 5,000 years ago. So I think that there are people, sensible people in governments around the planet who recognize a need for a new paradigm Planet Earth, where do we go from here? And I think that every society either learns how to get along with others or is destroyed. And that goes with, you know, that's the only way things can happen. If you're shooting enough guns, pretty soon somebody's gonna get hurt. And then somebody else is gonna get hurt and then pretty soon you got a mess. We've had plenty of those on this planet. And I think that becoming aware of visitation is going to be, it's going to have a shocking effect. It will affect religion. Simple question. Did Jesus have anything to do with the aliens out there? Or is he a, a god, a local god? That's not a trivial question for the church. Uh, there are many different forms of religion on this planet which have different views of how we fit into the scheme of things. So that's not an easy knot to untie without cutting it, which may not be such a good idea. So I'm intrigued by the fact that more and more people are thinking in terms of the galactic neighborhood, if you will. I'm very pleased about that. Can you say more about the alien nature of Bigfoot and other possible alien forms of contact? I'm intrigued with Bigfoot. I'm intrigued with gorillas. I'm intrigued with a lot of powerful beings uh, on the planet. Uh, I think there's no question that there's ample evidence to say that Bigfoot are real, but I've seen no evidence that they operate cities that they produce technology. Uh, 
that they create big weapons, which would be a major concern about anybody coming along. You know, are they building better atomic bombs or whatever kind of bombs you want? So I think Bigfoot are off to the side of the question. That is, they don't have a controlling influence. They are where they are, they do their thing. They may be acting in support of an alien group. I don't know. But I'm not concerned about them as being ready to rule the planet or attack others in a collective sort of way. So they're interesting, you know, that there could be a lot of different beings here that we're not interacting with particularly in a collective kind of fashion. They don't have a seat at the United Nations, you know. But uh, so I'm intrigued. But I don't think they're really an important part of how we go from where we are, nationalism to planetarianism, if I can create a term. I think it's certainly possible that the planet has been colonized from, that people have dropped off <laughs> the equivalent of different species as a place to get rid of them, as a place to see what impact they have on the society, a large social experiment, et cetera. Uh, I think they might very well be, I'll call it alien in origin, if I can put it that way, but not alien combined with technology. Uh, nothing I have heard, and I may be wrong, but nothing I have heard indicates that Bigfoot have developed their own technology for moving people, for killing people, for that. Those are two important things on this planet. So uh, they're an interesting aspect. Uh, you know, we, we're concerned about weeds. We don't grow them for crops, but they're a part of our environment that we need to be concerned about. And I think Bigfoot are a part of our environment that we should be concerned about. Where do we go from here with these guys or gals? Uh, I don't know. But as I say, on a large-scale planetary viewpoint, from, from that viewpoint, I don't think they're an important part of that puzzle. They may be an important part of the puzzle about how much interaction has there been between us and others. You know, it's one thing to say there are alien beings coming here, which I've been saying for many years, but what impact are they going to have on how we evolve is the big question. We've gotten to the point of having H-bombs. We could destroy a big chunk of the planet with a bit of foolishness. We've exploded 2,000 nuclear weapons. People look at me when I say that. What do you mean? Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I say, yeah, we've exploded 2,000 nuclear weapons getting ready to explode more kind of thing. That concerns the heck out of me. I don't feel responsible. I didn't work on developing nuclear weapons, but I'm a realist. They can sure make a heck of a mess out of a place. And so I think we need to take those into account. But I think that anybody who is coming here of their own volition is more advanced than we are because we can't go out there yet. And so we need to recognize that they will also have developed a means of getting along with each other. Otherwise, they don't survive because they have the means to destroy it. What should we be doing in preparation for planetary alien contact in the future? I think times have changed in attitude. It wasn't too many years ago that people would, said, would say we're the only ones around because we don't know about any others. Ignorance is bliss. You know, absence of evidence is evidence for absence, which is nonsense. I think we're heading in the right direction. I think the younger generation thinks in terms of there being life all over the place. That wasn't true when I was growing up. You were much a renegade if you thought there were other beings out there. Because if they were coming here, they'd talk to us. They'd land on the White House lawn, you know, and that, that silly nonsense. So I think what we're heading toward, I hope, I suppose, where the major nations will recognize that there's a need to take to start taking the actions that would be required for us to act as a planet 
instead of as a collection of independent individual nations who each do their own things and threaten everybody else. I mean, look around the planet. How must we look? We've exploded 2,000 nuclear weapons on this planet. We're not only two of them one people, thank goodness. But we're not terribly advanced in our behavior. And I think the next generation, I mean, I'm 84, so there's more coming. I think it will start to move in the direction of recognizing that with satellites, with space travel, uh, the times are changing. And I think governments are going to have to recognize that Yes, on the one hand, they don't want to tell anybody what they know because it could be used for weaponry. A fancy aircraft to bomb other people, to put it simply. On the other hand, I think they will recognize that we're at the point where we need to have a new vision of the future for the planet and everybody on it. I'm not talking communism or socialism or anything like that. I'm talking about a realistic approach to what do you do when you have a lot of people spending a lot of their energy getting ready to attack other people? That's a dangerous situation. There can be idiots. I'm a nuclear guy. I'm well aware that nuclear things have reframed the situation on the planet. I mean, we have submarines that can go around the world underwater. That means that they can be used to retaliate if somebody attacks. That's what keeps the peace. I can't destroy your retaliatory system because I don't know where those guys underwater are. They can get back at me. Well, I guess we better live at peace with each other. You won't attack me because you know I can get back at you. That's one way of keeping the peace, but I would much prefer it was a way of let's all work together. <laughs> How would you develop a program to reach out to the possible alien presence already here? I think if we spent a considerable greater effort on getting involved, reaching out, becoming aware that there are others out there and our planet has life and, and quote, intelligence and technology, but we're not the first. There are others more advanced than we are. And they have figured out answers to some of the questions that we haven't figured out answers to. How to get along with each other is, is the basic one. And also, we have recognized that there are limits to the resources that are available on a planet. We can use those up. We can waste them. We can make it tough for three generations from now for them to have the things that they need because we're using them up. If you don't replenish the soil, pretty soon it's not going to grow anything. I mean, it's the same kind of concern. So one way around that is to recognize that we need to interact with the more advanced civilizations out there. The rules may say that we can't do anything about it at the moment. I don't know. But we've certainly not given an indication that I know of that, OK, we're here. We'd like to talk to you to see what choices we have, how we can get to a better world. If somebody else has made it, how can we learn from that experience? We're certainly smart enough to realize, every parent knows, that a child has to learn from other people's experience as well as his own. That's not the only sample of possibilities, in other words, the, the family or the neighborhood. It's much, much larger than that. We need to take that, call it globalism, I don't care what you call it. And I think that's an important part of this whole question. And because I don't know what the aliens' tolerance for attacks on them is. How much will they put up with, with us trying to shoot them down, maybe having done so? Uh, so I'm concerned about that. I have a great grandson. So I'm longitudinal in viewpoint uh, about what's going on. So it's a very exciting time, and I wish I had more of it available to me. 